thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Cree, Assiniboine, and Ojibwa Nation and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Additionally, we honor the gifts, teachings, and heritage of the Métis people of Nation 4. Welcome to worship here at First United Church in Fort Saskatchewan in Alberta. On this night, many years ago, a man and a woman wandered the streets of Bethlehem seeking for shelter. They had traveled a long way from Nazareth and now tired and worn, the young woman is ready to deliver her firstborn child. The scriptures tell us that what was offered to them was the place where animals were, and the first place the child was laid was on the eating trough for the animals. As I welcome you to worship, let us remember that on this night so many years ago, something special happened. Tonight, we celebrate that God has come near to us. God was incarnate in Jesus. Whoever you are, and wherever you are, I welcome you to worship or worship of God, who takes the initiative to meet us, and the God who is not far away from us. For because of this night, we know we worship the one who understands our human reality. May you in this worship experience love, joy, peace, and hope. Welcome to worship.
Our Advent journey is complete as we witness asylum, isolation, and want. Yet the birth of the baby Jesus in humble circumstances opens us to people living on the margins. We come to remember the story and to live into the transformation it prompts. We proclaim, like the heavenly chorus, the good news of vulnerability. We come like the shepherds, filled with wonder at what could be. We come to receive the gracious gift of becoming of potential. We light the first candle, reminding us of the way of hope. We light the second candle, reminding us of Christ's path of peace. We light the third candle, reminding us of spirit-filled joy. We light the fourth candle, reminding us of God's self-giving love. We light this Christ candle for the arrival of Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Our prayer comes from Gordon Dunbar in Ontario. Let us pray. We come in worship to honor and to welcome you, O God, in baby Jesus. In your humility, may we find humility. In your loving, may we give our own love. In your humanity, may we affirm our own humanity. In your coming, may we share your good news with all our aching world. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, tonight we prepare for your good news of great joy which has come to all people. Refresh our amazement at the birth of Christ, that we may be open to the new life you create among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us join in our prayers of confession. It is Christmas Eve again, God. We are barely ready for it. So much to do to get ready. Gifts to buy and wrap. Trees to trim. Houses to decorate. We're in a whirlwind of activity. In the midst of the busyness, we sometimes miss what it is all about. You coming to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. Help us hear anew your promise of hope and salvation and love as we hear the familiar carols. Forgive us for forgetting the magic of this night, for focusing ourselves on what we need to do instead of the miracle of Jesus' birth. Rock us out of our complacency. Let us hear angel voices and see shepherds hurrying to a stable. Feel the baby's soft breath on our cheeks and ponder in our hearts what all this means for the world and for us. Illuminate our hearts that we might follow the way of the Christ child, a way of peace and justice, a way of compassion and grace. Amen. Friends, God's love knows no bounds. Love comes down at Christmas, a love so deep and so profound that nothing will ever be the same again. Know that this love comes for you to touch you, to heal you, to forgive you, to make you whole. Amen. Our first reading is one of good news from the prophet Isaiah. From Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoicing at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have sh shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
Our second reading this evening is from a letter Paul wrote to his associate, Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, hope of the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Our gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch of their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We thank you for the offerings you give towards the work of the church. We thank you for the offerings not only of your money, but of your time, your talents, and your abilities. As we make this prayer of dedication, we offer not only our monies, we offer ourselves. Let us pray. There are so many things to be thankful for tonight, O God. Receive these tokens of our gratitude for your love incarnate in the babe of Bethlehem. May they help us to share God with us with all the world. May they help us to breathe joy into a world that needs a sense of wonder and joy. Amen. Let us pray. And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be found acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some years ago, when I was a teenager, the minister at my home church preached one Christmas about Martians coming to Earth at Christmas. Yes, you heard me right. Martians, people from Mars, coming to Earth. The main basis of the um, sermon was to ask if persons who are not familiar with Christmas were to come to earth and see us at this time, what would they think? Would they know what this celebration was all about? I've reflected on that sermon over the years and wondered not so much would they know what the celebration was all about, but more so, what would they know about the God that we are worshipping at this time? What does our Christmas celebration tell us about God? Oftentimes, we can hear a story so often that the impact of the story can be lost on us, and sometimes we try to fill in the gaps of the story. So tonight, it might be good for us to stop once more and listen to the story from Luke, as Luke tells us the story of the birth of Jesus. Luke begins chapter 2 by saying to us, Who was the emperor? And it was important that Luke places in context that this was the emperor, this was the emperor of Rome, one who felt that he was God and Lord of all the world, all the known places of the world at the time. And Luke tells us that at that time, a tax, a census has been called. You must remember that for the people of Jesus' time, censuses would not have been a very happy thing. It meant increased taxation. And taxation was a burden onto the people. Burden because those who received the taxes were not known for their honesty. They would be taking more than the tax. And so taxation was one of heaping on to the rich and the poor becoming poorer. The word of the taxation meant hardship, increased hardship for the people. And in particular for two young people, two persons engaged to be married, 
and one who was heavily pregnant. The fact that she was heavily pregnant did not matter much to the authorities of the time. She, like everyone else, had to follow what were the rules of the day. Luke paints a picture of the world continuing of hardships around and people doing what they were told to do. These two travel to Bethlehem, and in Bethlehem, this woman gives birth. Traditionally, we have thought of the birth of Jesus occurring in a stable, and as a matter of fact, during the liturgy, you may hear me speak of being born in a stable. But recently, scholars have pointed out to us that our interpretation may not be very accurate. In fact, in Jesus' time, Joseph would have found shelter, accommodation with distant relatives in Bethlehem. What we describe as being the stable may well have been the family room, because in Jesus' time, the animals would have slept indoors with the family. There would have been a place for guests to come to the household, and apparently the guest room was filled. So Mary has birth with the rest of the family present. Mary has birth with other people around. Mary has birth as every ordinary person, as every other common person of the time would have done. What does this tell us about God? It tells us that in the midst of hardship, in the midst of uncertain times, God comes to ordinary people. God comes to people not much different from you and I. God comes in the midst of ordinary circumstances. And while the circumstances may not have been the best, while the guest room may not have been laid open for Mary and Joseph, still God comes to people who are surrounded by family. That's an important point for us to remember. God comes to us even in the midst of uncertainty. God comes to the ordinary people. It is interesting that we speak of Christmas as being the time of the incarnation, where God was wrapped in flesh, where God became human, some would say, where God was a special way in this baby born in Bethlehem. A baby is one of the most vulnerable human beings you can find in this world. A baby just born relies upon mother and those who are around for care and for providing for the essential needs. A mother just giving birth to a child is also in a very vulnerable place in her life. Usually the woman would have wanted her own mother nearby. The picture given by Luke with all of the nice sanitizing of scripture points out to us a vulnerable situation in Bethlehem, a baby born. What does this tell us about God? It tells us that God is not afraid to be vulnerable to us. That God is not afraid to come to us in our vulnerableness. That in the vulnerability of the moment, God shows incredible strength. That in the time when things were not exactly what they needed to be and things could have gone south in a big way, that even there, God is present. And God is present even in the vulnerable moments of life. In the moments when we don't know what to do. In the moment when we feel all alone, in the moment when we have to depend on others for getting by, in those vulnerable moments, God is present with us. God is present in the vulnerable nature of a baby. And then the scriptures tell us, according to Luke, that the shepherds was announced the good news that shepherds were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock. It's interesting that we somehow take the shepherds for granted and fail to realize that these men, these men living out in the open with their sheep, 
where people, although necessary for the religion of the day, would have oftentimes been men who were dirty because they could not have a bath often, men who were considered to be outcast of the religious order because they could not keep all of the laws of Judaism at the time, to these rugged, dirty, outcast, and unclean religiously men, God announces God's presence to the outcast, to those ostracized by society, the word comes of good news. Good news because this would be a life-changing news. What does this say to us about God? It tells us that oftentimes those whom we may describe as being on the fringes of society those who may not always be the best clothed, those who we may feel are not allowed into decent company, to those, even to those, this news must be spread and shared. Shared not only with those who are in church or in the godly group, but with those who are outcast, those whom society may pretend that they don't exist. To them, this news comes. Life changing news, news that would bring great joy. God comes to us in the ordinary, as ordinary people. God comes to us in our vulnerable moments. God comes to us even when we feel alone, ostracized, and away from everyone else. God comes to us. That is the good news of tonight. That is the new good news of every Christmas season. It tells us of the God who is with us and never far away from us. It brings a particular quality of message, especially at this time in the midst of the COVID times that we're living in, a time of uncertainty, a time of fear among some, a time when our medical professionals are tired, a time when some people tonight are wondering about the health of their family and friends, a time when we cannot be together as we would usually be together as people to share in the festivities. It reminds us that even in these uncertain and unusual times, to us ordinary men and women, boys and girls, God is present. It reminds us in the vulnerability of this time, God is present with us. It reminds us that even when we feel alone, even to those who cannot be with others, God is present with us. It is life-changing, life-altering news. For even as the shepherds returned to their flocks and back to that lonely place in where they were, they went not as they left. They left, they returned with good news in their heart. Something had changed. What about us this Christmas? What does this news bring to us? It reminds us, my friends, that even where we are at, we can reach out to those who may be also feeling alone. It reminds us that we, even where we are at, can reach out and help to bring a difference into the life of others, even as we maintain physical or social distancing. It reminds us that wherever we are, no matter how bleak or dark the circumstances of our night, we are not alone. When I came to Canada in 2011, one of the first things I heard in church were the words of the new creed. It starts off with a rousing affirmation. We are not alone. We live in God's world. May we tonight, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, as we celebrate the incarnation of God in Jesus, as we celebrate the wonder of Christmas, be reminded we are not alone. Whoever we are, wherever we are, however we are, we are not alone. 
Christmas reminds us God is with us. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up our hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. In ancient days, you created us in your image to be reflections of your glory. When we fell short and dimmed the brilliance of your light shining through us, you held our hands and walked with us out of the garden into all the corners of the earth. When we were afraid to look upon your glory, you came to us as a quiet traveler, 
as a burning bush and as a pillar of light. You called us to be people of light, to walk no longer in darkness, and always you light our way. Even when we walk in darkness, you shine your light and offer grace, awaiting our return to you. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to reveal your glory and grace. And so, with your people on earth and all the angels of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn of singing. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your salvation and grace. Came to earth on this night long ago. Born as a child, birthed in a stable, surrounded by the poorest of the poor, Jesus came with your message of loving grace to the humblest of all. Through this child we have seen your glory. Through this child we are invited into your presence, reconciled to your righteousness, and called forth to walk in your light. With joy and gratitude we break this bread, and remember another night when your grace was revealed. For on that night, many years after Jesus' birth, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. With awe and wonder we fill this cup, and remember another night when your forgiveness was revealed. For on that night, many years after Jesus' birth, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of love and grace, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as your children of light, in union with the brightness of Christ's glory, and as we proclaim Christ's birth and the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us, that we who walk in darkness might walk forth in the light of Christ. Shine your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine, that your glorious grace and love might flow through us as the very presence of Christ. As we receive these gifts, may we shine forth as your people, that the glory of Christ might be revealed for all to see. Amen. And now as Jesus taught his disciples, so we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The bread which we break is our sharing in the broken body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is our sharing in the outpoured blood of Christ.
Together we pray. We do not come to this your table, O merciful Lord, with self-confidence and pride, trusting in our own righteousness, but we trust in your great and many mercies. We are not worthy to gather the crumbs under your table, but you, O Lord, are unchanging in your mercy and your nature's love. Grant us therefore, God of mercy, God of grace, so to eat at this table, that we may receive the Spirit in spirit and in truth, the body and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may live and grow in his likeness, and that we may forevermore live in him and he in us. Amen. I invite you now to share in the body of Christ with me. I invite you now to share as we remember the outpoured blood of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in Christ and united us to you and with each other. Grant that we who participated in this sacrament will be living representatives of the living Christ. May we become your instruments of grace and peace in all the world. May we be agents of hope in the face of hopelessness. May we be channels of love where there is no love. Grant that we may forevermore live in Christ, and may Christ live in us. Amen. Friends, go now in wonder. Go to bring light to those in the night joy to those who can find no joy and hope to a world that often may be living in hopelessness go with the song of angels in your ears and the love of god in your hearts go and spread the word that the babe of bethlehem is born for all god is with us and may grace, mercy, and peace from God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit be with us all and all who claim an interest in our prayers, this night and forevermore. Amen. From me and my family to you and your family, I wish you all a Merry Christmas and all God's blessings for the new year.